Hey, what is up, everyone? It is Rich. All right, so we were going to do a live show today, but Kelsey's actually got to, uh, he's got to run and pick up his brother, but it sounds like it's uh, quite, quite a drive for him. So he's going to be tied up for quite a bit of the day. So what I thought I would do is um, do a... Uh, a video on Mark Silvestri on drawing comic books, sequential art, processing a script, um, how you kind of put your best foot forward, but also don't um, y you know miss a deadline, and and how to allocate your resources, meaning um, time, what you have to draw, all that. It's going to be a really really good and interesting video, uh, and I'm excited to do it. I was trying to think of someone contemporary to do it on so if you have any recommendations for spotlight videos that you would like to see moving forward um where we kind of um, reverse engineer th in theory the process that these people use or the thought process they might be using by all means let me know in the comment section below um and then let me do a, qu a few quick plugs so uh i'll have links to kelsey's youtube channel um and you can find out what books he's currently working on and get links to those campaigns we've got blaster kid coming up i'm going to be launching that campaign very soon um, and then also I want to plug my Patreon. If you have not checked out my Patreon, I would highly, highly recommend it. There's over 700 videos there. I upload all the time. Right now we're working on um, a figure drawing, anatomy, construct constructing figures. I'm going to be breaking down um, how to set up shots, like with perspective, like, you know, creating scenes. Um, we cover everything. There's so many videos there. So I'll have a link to Patreon. It's a dollar for full access. There's tip jars that you can use that are a little bit bigger than that. I also do reviews. People love my reviews. I review their work. And it's really, I mean, if you've ever taken a review from me and you have um, feedback, by all means, please leave in the comments section below. I know I've done some just recently, and the people are ecstatic when they get the, the advice and also just a set of eyes looking at the work. And then I, I still do actually offer direct lessons, so it's an hour lesson. You can check that out if you want. Um, and um, yeah, we can get you on point with penciling or inking. So let's do this. All right, Mark Silvestri, he is a man on a mission, and his mission is to draw awesome. He's very, very good. Um, these books were done probably five years into his professional career, if not a little tiny bit more. Um, there's a lot of stuff that Mark did that are like little small odd jobs that a lot of people probably aren't aware that he did before X-Men. So if you really, well, I think you can find it on Wikipedia. If you look in, in his Wikipedia, you can actually see that uh, there's other stuff. I've seen pretty much... I wouldn't say everything that he's done, but I've seen a lot. But he had come a long way at this point, and he was really, really drawing good. But at the same time, Mark was working for Marvel Comics, as was Todd McFarlane and a lot of our other favorite artists. And these guys were working for a company who had deadlines. And, you know, there's expectations. Mark doesn't write these scripts. Mark doesn't ink the pages. His job is to tell the story and get the stuff looking as good as possible and then in on time so that they can get it on the shelves to all of you. So, look, I know now and for a long time, there's many ways to do comic books and some collectors might go, you know, fuck all that. I don't want monthly books. If the quality is going to suffer... I'm not interested. I would rather have an artist do one book a year and have it be amazing. That's fine. That's totally a possibility. But for people that are learning to draw, we face some different challenges in as much as we actually have to create the art. Um, and so there's just, there's, um, you know, like you, you uh, comics is budgetless, but at the same time, uh, there's, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean it's like you you could draw as much as you want on a page like like there's no budgetary limitations to as much things as you want to put in except that eventually there's going to be expectations for you to actually have something in someone's hands um so uh you know it's it's picking the level of detail that's going to keep your book consistent and not completely annihilate you uh, the other thing I would recommend too there's two things I'm going to say really fast before we, we fully get into this is um, you know, if you're learning to draw or you're kind of earlier on the front end of it and you don't draw great right now, um, 
I, the thing is, is you spending 30 hours on a page versus 12 hours on a page probably isn't going to make a huge difference. It may or may not, but, but, but just keep that in mind that, that because, uh, you hear that Alex Ross spends 36 hours it takes for him to do a painting. Um, that's fine. Uh, you know, but, but I would say that, that like you should try to hit between eight and 12 hours per page if you can somewhere in there would be a good thing because you start spending 16 to say 25 hours per page which look some people do um i've done it myself i've spent even more time on pieces um uh it's very very difficult to get up for that again and again and again every time you're starting a page you're digging in for days and sometimes weeks to finish a piece so that's a certain personality that can withstand that sort of um uh, workload and and look a lot of times when you're drawing you're really not sure how the thing is going to turn out and there's nothing more daunting especially as a young learning artist uh, than thinking that you're going to spend 30 hours on a piece to screw it up 22 hours into it <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So so just be mindful of that. And then the other thing is is that you want to keep a level of consistency with your work. So the expectations, if you do spend a ridiculous amount of time on your drawings, is they're always going to look like that. And then one final bit of advice. I would say that if you're early in your penciling career, I do not recommend inking yourself. Get good at drawing first. You can always learn the ink later. I know the temptation is there, especially with digital tools. Um, but, uh, if you don't draw to a, a I would say high, well, like at least an intermediate level to, if not like high intermediate, you're going to have to be the judge of that. I, I would focus on drawing, get better at drawing and worry about inking it later. Um, so anyway, that's my two bits. I've seen many, many fairly nice drawings ruined by just ho-hum quote unquote inks. Just because you put ink on a piece, it's not really inked. So anyway, let's get into this now. All right. And this this actually in, in spots is quite rough. Uh, I think if you saw the original board of this, it would look quite a bit different. This looks like a fairly dark um, reproduction of like the line work and stuff like that. But it's, it's always got a very, very cool amount of energy. It's interesting because this right here doesn't really look like Dan Green's inks to me. In fact, it looks a little tiny bit like Todd McFarlane. And, and I'm trying to remember, was there uh, was there an issue where Todd pitched in? I don't know why. None of, nothing else on the piece looks like McFarlane inks, except for this face to me. Uh, all of this just is nothing that I ever have seen Dan Green do. This has got, you know what this could be? Um, I'm going to speculate on this. This could, in theory, be someone from the Marvel bullpen. There might have been, like, something that the editor didn't like about the piece, and they had someone on the premises go in and scratch him up a bit more. I don't know, but this just doesn't look like a professional inker's work to me, which is ironic because Todd is a very famous professional artist, but if you, you there's bits and pieces of the things that Todd did that are actually kind of weird but this is all these are these are sending me all kinds of weird mixed signals this stuff right here all of this it's very odd but it could be Dan maybe they were trying to bring a little um McFarlane into it so all right let's keep going and see but you can see that there's not an extreme level of detail here and in fact he fought the urge to like render out the pants and just basically had all the rip material, which works quite good. It's actually quite dynamic. I think the color choices are a little funky, um, you know, pink and green and all that, and purples and blues. And <laughs> it's uh, that old school color, which can actually look good. Like, this looks nice. I, I actually think the colors on this are nice. But, you know, look, if we just focus in on this little girl's face, she's a little unusual looking. In fact, the features on her face are a little big. Let me show you uh, lasso. So I'm so used to being in Clip Studio now, I forget. This will look weird because it's going to, um, uh, what would you call it? Like, um, it'll be white around her face, but her, her facial features should actually be a little tiny bit smaller. Just a bit. I think that's a little more. She looks just a tiny bit cuter even just doing that, but watch when I take it back. Uh, it could just be the position of it. It's, it's like her mouth is quite big. Um, all right, let's see, let's see, let's see. 
So this is all very, very cool. Man, Mark, he's such a, like, everything just looks suggested. Um, I'm curious, what I want to see is not so much the action stuff, but I my focus in a weird way was I wanted to see him do more pedestrian pages, meaning just, you know, it's like cop station, um, firemen standing around outside after something's gone down kind of thing, because those are tough things to do. So I do a lot of this stuff in the backgrounds. I had to do like a party and I tried to, to it's weird because I didn't realize that, uh, I, you know, I guess, yeah, that's interesting. I didn't really realize that I, I'm trying to think of, I kind of think of it as a Mignola thing, but, but, uh, I guess Mark does it too, but it's, it's like, if you have to draw a crowd, I really actually like these sort of reverse silhouettes, meaning that they're not filled in with black like this stuff, but you definitely, you want the people in the foreground to have a little bit of detail. So it's a good takeaway for me is that I need to actually have at least a few of the characters in the front, um, suggested more because this is a handful for colorists Co like my colorist keeps trying to draw on these characters and put like faces and stuff on it and it looks a little weird but i think flat color is kind of really what i'm going for it's weird because when you start penciling stuff although i'm not thinking color i do actually need to be mindful of that i, I mean i am but you, you know sometimes you assume that someone's gonna get like oh it's like that's a Mignola thing oh and then that's this thing and I don't I don't I'm not that calculated when I draw it but I mean obviously the ideas come from somewhere um this actually is kind of Mignola-ish too but again look at this face this is unusual looking I mean she has no nose um you know but you know it's the suggestion of the character it's it's there it's interesting this is nice um I was gonna say something else too. Uh, oh, we'll get to it, I'm sure. It's, it's it's like a lot of the things that I'm gonna recommend. There there are things that I think are very important, so it's not like uh, I'd forget it for pages and pages. Yeah, this is nice. You oh, you know one one thing too is you definitely definitely want to be mindful of word balloons. Like if you're drawing pages um, and they're actually going to be like lettered, uh, if your script comes with it or if you've written it yourself, I mean it's if you've written it yourself, it's a little bit easier to to make room for the word balloons, I think. But but uh, when someone asks you to draw something and then they they also want quite a bit of dialogue on it, um, you want to be mindful of that because that you know it would be a shame to. Uh, spend say three hours on a background right here and say the word balloons covered it up you know if this word balloon happened to be over here but he had spent you know a lot of time detailing something on that wall it would be unfortunate things like this you're leaving a lot of space it would would actually be very very cool to see these pages with no word balloons because you would actually see how simple some of these areas actually are um without the lettering you know um but Mark knew, look, I mean, I, I would assume that he knew in this panel, but I mean, three fairly, wor wor you know, word heavy word balloons went on that. Um, things like this are interesting too, because it's like, you know, you draw a scene like this and you've got smoke down here and it's coming out the window and all of this. This is, he's got a lot of Mignola. He, you know, what's interesting is he was probably looking at Mignola to figure out how to draw this stuff, quote unquote, quicker. I really believe that. Is this is looks just like out of like Farford and the Grey Mauser and some of the stuff that Mignola Cosmic Odyssey maybe a little bit, um, but uh, you know you may picture the word balloon going over here and maybe another one down here and then if they don't do it all of a sudden your art can kind of look empty like right now um, I'm gonna when I'm done with this video I have to go over the colors for the first issue of Crystal Planet and then kind of my part of the job for that book will be over but um I, I need to do some notes on about half the book and um uh the pages look really weird to me right now because there's no word balloons on them and it makes me nervous because it looks like I was very lazy in some spots but I remember how much word balloons there are but it definitely it's it's created a level of sort of um concern for me but the thing is is once i see that book lettered and i see it actually as a comic book i'm going to really understand better how to utilize the space 
but you know i mean again up here you can see it's it's a lot of open space and in fact he didn't even really draw bricks here but the thing is is depending on how it colors well here let's do this we can turn this one gray <clears throat> i'll remove some of this so we can see what it looks like but uh i'll re remove some more gray yeah so this is kind of what the page looked like in black and white overall i'll give it one more time i guess so this is kind of what the page looked like in black and white. Well, not kind of. It would, you'd probably see a little bit more detail. I'm sure some of the lines are disintegrating. But, I mean, you know, for these brick walls in this building, I mean, he actually was pretty clever, um, you know, because he knew, one, there. this is the opening splash of the book. So you've got, you know, the name of the story, the presents. There's quite a bit of inner dialogue going on. We've got the credits and word, balloon, and word balloons. So interesting but it's a nice page it's a nice shot too he's got a little bit of action going on so he turns the um shot but but really this is just two point perspective but because he did it at an angle um it it feels a little more dynamic because the lines now aren't going just straight up and down there's a little bit of a i, I maybe it's three point perspective it feels like two it could be a slight three point perspective so um Oh, this is so good. Yeah, dang. I kind of did this with Kelsey in mind. He really liked my Todd McFarlane video where we I, I did a video called like um, how to draw boring pages. And it, there is something interesting about that. And what I mean by boring pages is just pages where the superheroes aren't doing superhero stuff. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're boring, but, um, you know, but McFarlane had a lot of interesting ways of drawing things just enough or putting them just peeking into the panel where... Uh, you know, you didn't have to overdo it. Like, this is a bar um, that looks like it's been blown up or something like that, like the ruins of a bar. But, you know, he basically didn't even draw one full bottle. Uh, you've got a bowl with pretzels and a telephone. <coughs> it does the trick, you know. Maybe it was a mob hangout. This is actually funny. So you can indicate things, like here, like, okay, so the script for this was... You know, the, the Hawaiian guy, you know, is on the cell phone making like some sort of deal or whatever, but they're at a bus station and we've got people waiting in line to get on buses. You know, if you think of it literally, you know, you might be going like, oh my God, I've got to draw a bus station and a guy on the phone. Um, I mean, he hardly drew fingers holding the phone, let, a, let alone um, any buses. He just drew parts of buses. Kelsey loves this shit. He... <laughs> What's up, Kelsey? I know you're going to watch this because you love Mark Silvestri and Dan Green. And you like uh, the idea of simplifying things, which we all do to some extent. Again, this is real nice. Let's do this in gray. -na 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 -na. Or a little, little bit more gray. Let's see what we got going on. Yeah, that'll work. Oh, wait. So I'm perfectionist to have to have it all out if I can do it. Oh, whoa, no, it's too much. We'll just do the lighter gray. There. That's good enough. With that one spot. So this is interesting. I like her eyes. Her eyes are cute. And this is nice. But, you know, like he can't draw any detail on the cache. The gun is really, really simple. Oh, that was what I was going to say is... um yeah like like uh when you when you draw from scripts and stuff like that you can really be asked to draw a lot of things that you maybe don't normally draw or don't have reference for and stuff like that and i've been kind of trying to convince uh my patrons to just go for it and it was interesting is i i was telling them a few days ago i had um a day where i didn't need to have um like I was able to listen to some of the David Finch uh, tutorial videos, not the live stream ones, but some of his, his tutorials. And David echoes really a lot of the things that I've been telling my patrons for a while, which is is you really need to build up a level of confidence to be able to fake stuff. Uh, and then you kind of create the ability to be able to fake stuff. Like if you had to draw slot machines, you just need to be able to kind of do it. You've seen a slot machine. You know that there's three rows of things that spin. You know there's a handle. You know that there's, a, you know, where the coins come out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you don't need reference for that. He had to draw, like, a VCR. It's like, you know, cash. You, you, 
you you can always add more information to what you know like like so this is the payout boost he kept it real simple in fact it actually looks kind of weird because um you know you would almost picture that this would go to the roof but it actually is like a self-contained box and it actually looks quite small this person standing next to it looks like they're like five seven ish and i mean that's a very tight little room i mean it would only be maybe six 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 and a half feet tall but stuff like that happens. It's not a huge deal. Um, you know, do we take into consideration how long someone generally spends reading a comic book page? I mean, we're analyzing these pages and we're still only spending like a minute or two on each one. Imagine someone reading the story and, and you've had to draw, uh, you know, two people arguing in a living room. They were having dinner at the table, and the, and the person came in late, so the wife was mad that the guy got home late. Uh, but they sit down and try to have a functional dinner, and she can tell he's been drinking, and they sort of argue, and maybe he flips a plate on the floor. You know what I mean? Like, how long is someone going to really spend reading that page? But then you also want to make sure that you show that you care about what you draw. But it's like, you know, would you spend 30 hours on that page? Because if you've been spending 30 hours on all your other pages, then in theory, you would be kind of expected to keep the level of detail up to that point. So you need to figure out your comfort zone. What's the comfort zone for you? Are you a five to eight hour a page person? Or are you eight to 10? Eight to 12, it's a wider window. Sometimes you go crazy, sometimes you don't. Maybe you do 16 to 20 hours. And then you have the hardcores. They're over 30 hours. 28 hours or over per page. Or piece. They're out there. I'm telling you. It's like Jaws. I'm going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> Look at that. His gun's a little tighter here. Like, like uh, it's still quite ruled out, but... Um, you know, it's there. I don't like, you know, I've said this before. I really know nothing about guns in terms of how they're constructed or the mechanics behind them, but it's really something that I need to become more familiar with because well, generally speaking, if you draw comic books, you're going to have to draw weapons, you know, um, you're also going to probably have to draw vehicles and you know, that's, uh, machinery, you know, you need to be able to at least fake some type of machinery. So I, you know, I pointed this out on Patreon. Actually, J. Scott Campbell recently did uh, a piece. This wasn't the one that I was talking about on Patreon, but it's a good example. Uh, he had to draw a character with a bunch of knives around them and, uh, I, and, and box cutters and stuff like that. And I'll tell you, man, Jeff always does his homework. It's like he had, I don't know, six to maybe eight little pointy objects around this character. They all look cool. Each, each and every one of them I went like, yeah, that looks like a box cutter. Yeah, that looks like a fly knife or whatever they call the ones that sort of like can flip around. And yeah, that looks like this. is It was really, really cool. So, you know, someone like J. Scott Campbell, and, and I know this from, from not only sharing an office with him, but being friends with him and seeing what he had going on in his house. Um, he has binders and binders full of reference. I mean, he if he has to draw something, he will do the homework and figure out what, you know... Uh, like, you know, I mean, he's famous for drawing cute girls. So it's like he keeps up with clothes and fashion. And when he draws someone in tennis shoes, he doesn't just draw. And, and then in a, in a weird way, that's a little bit different than what uh, someone like Silvestri was doing back at this point. Um, you know, Jeff kind of makes stuff sort of legit. Um you know, and it really kind of kicked me in the ass because about halfway through Crystal Planet, I, I was like, I, I, I was like, man, I need to be doing a little bit more of this. I need some more authenticity with this stuff because it's great to kind of make it up out of your head. But if it's not looking as good as you want it to, then you then you need to you need to up your game. So it's a push and pull with the, these things. You know, you incorporate more more of what you want really really valuable tool i've been encouraging people to you know if they want to draw comic book stories to just start drawing pages ah, this is so good um 
uh, because it, it will really kind of show you what you're able to do to some degree naturally or with what you've learned up to that point. And then and you get a pretty good sense of what you suck at or what you're lacking. And, and it really makes looking at other people's work interesting because you'll see things in their work, even if you're not directly influenced by them, but you just see someone doing something well that maybe you don't do as well. And it'll it'll uh, remind you, hey, I need to step it up. My tennis shoes suck. I'm not, I'm not putting any kind of cool factor to it, so... Ultimately, we are trying to draw stuff that looks cool. This is another fantastic face. Boy, oh boy, he's so good. He really has this arm, these arms down. It's always fun to see him. And he keeps the, the anatomy quite simple. Like, like, he's just suggesting, you know, on the forearm, really, like three or four shapes and a little bit of the bone underneath. But it works great, you know. Like, he doesn't have, like, every muscle drawn right here. Like, you know, you can see you can see suggestions of the abs and all the side muscles. This is good. I always find these crouch poses um, tricky because it's like, like what you do with the crotch, the thigh, and then the butt cheek that usually will sort of poke out can, can look a little... Um, funky and then even this you've got to really keep your proportions the amount of torso that you're going to show this is nice very simple buildings you know even this you know really really just i, I don't want to say crudely drawn but man there's just not a lot going on up there is this enough what's your opinion do you think like a background like this does is it like you go yeah you know i don't have a problem with it is this more something that was acceptable in the late 80s, early 90s? And wouldn't it be acceptable in 2021? I mean, that's why I was saying, if you could recommend artists that are working like modern day that, that uh, you know, may, maybe have to um, solve these same problems, like what's the level of detail versus it? It's tough too, because the thing is, is, you know, people go like, oh, so-and-so does this or that. It's like they only draw like two comics a year. It's it's at that point you're really like illustrating comics, even if the the end result uh, isn't the same. There's definitely a different approach to eight to ten books a year, we'll say, than um, three comics a year or two, you know. And Mark, there's a high likelihood that he was doing a dozen or more comics. I think the I'm trying to remember. I think it was the X Men book that was shipping double two a month. That's nuts. Um, I think this stuff was monthly, but you know sometimes monthly means like three and a half weeks. This is nice. Let's look at this one in black and white. Looks fun. But yeah, you know, doing that Crystal Planet book, it really was an eye opener for me. I had so much to manage. That's kind of what I've been preaching to people interested in um, uh, drawing books. Is the first obstacle that you're going to have to deal with is is um, there's a level of organization and kind of management of uh, what would you call it like uh, responsibilities that you kind of have to deal with. Uh, I could, the analogy that I could use would be a uh, kind of a construction one where it's like, like when you're an inker or a colorist, you kind of show up and it's like your responsibility is to just make sure that the garden looks nice. You know, you show up at a house and they say, rich, you're so good at making the garden look beautiful. Just go out there and make sure all the trees are trimmed nicely and the grass looks good. And you've cleaned up all the leaves and all that. And it's like, you know, that's, an important job. I mean, it definitely sells the sizzle of uh, a, an attractive looking exterior to a home. When you're a penciler, like on in Crystal Planet, as a, for instance, for me, I literally showed up and it was a vacant lot. <laughs> All we had was a concept of what the book was and a script. Nothing had been designed. Nothing had ever really been drawn. Um, and I had to literally from the bottom up just go like, all right, how do I make a futuristic army how do i make a futuristic army that's lo-fi 
and more primitive? How do I create a planet that's a million years in the future? How do I create modern day Earth? How do I design the, you know, seven characters that are appearing right now? How do I design the other five that appear later? How do I create the weaponry for the armies? It was overwhelming. And, and what ends up happening is it'll actually affect the way that you draw. You know, all your plans at that point start to become more of a survival instinct initially, I think. You know, if you've done it a bunch of times, I think it's a different um, experience. But, like, for me, I, I mean, every page I was just kind of going, like, how am I going to get through this? Because the first book was... Well, it was, I did 26 interiors and a cover, and the whole series is 150 pages. So I had to be mindful of that, you know. There was the, the daily responsibilities that I had, but there was also the, the, the whole book responsibilities. About halfway through the first issue, too, um, I had to... Uh, I started kind of coming up with a style that I thought would work better for the book, but I couldn't really shift gears at that point because it would have made the first issue look inconsistent. But as we head into the second book, and then I'll be working on Blaster Kid simultaneously, um, I'm going to kind of start to pull the style uh, into a different direction because I, I, again, I created the survival, get through the first issue look. Now I want to refine it. I want to make it cooler. I want to make it... Uh, more dynamic. I want to have better camera angles. I want to uh, see what the lettering and the coloring was going to do to things. Because, um, again, even for me as an inker, when I would ink books, once I've seen how the new colorist, if I haven't worked with them before, colors the book, that actually does affect a tiny bit how I approach the lines. Because if they're like um, Dean... Dean White is an example who colors John Romita Jr. He's got a very heavily painted style that actually kind of overwhelms like your line work at times. I don't mean that in a negative way, but um, uh, it's it's like he really is like he's on top of everything. Some coloring like this, I mean, you see how easily easily. Whoa, sorry. You see how easy it is for me to remove this old school color. So this is like line art with almost color underneath it. You know, like the black lines are in front of everything and the color sits underneath it. Um, uh, who colored? I'm trying to think of who colored. Well, Kelsey was going to color new Superman that I did with Victor Bogdanovic, but we used, um, Oh shoot. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. He's a real good colorist too. Um, but, uh, his colors, you know, I had to adjust to a little bit. He he almost had like a very uh, like um, well, it'd be hard to explain. But colorful, but kind of um, you know, uh, be like not knockouts, but yeah. So you kind of acclimate to sort of the team around you. It's interesting, you know. Everybody kind of plays up to their strengths. This is really nice, man. The inks are great on this. But yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to show you this art, but then also give you, I guess, insight into what the process is for for these different artists when they do stuff like this. This is actually a quite detailed page, honestly. This would take a while. It would take a while to pencil and uh, a while to ink. This is definitely not a very simple, simple page. Man, the inks are so good. Oh, and there's actually a couple of pages. There's two pages in here that are actually like from the original art. So you're going to see a little bit of what the um, like RGB scan of the original art looks like, which is real nice. His arm is super big. It's way too long and big, um, but it looks fine. You know, I mean, it's not super duper noticeable. He has such good hands. God, they're just suggestions of hands, but boy, they look great. And these buildings are a little more detailed. Like like this to me is is plenty of detailed for buildings. Um, uh, you know, any more? I mean, you know, you're just flexing. Oh, I love this cover. Let's see what it looks like. I think I don't know. I don't know how this will work. This is a little dark to maybe remove all the gray. Let's see. Will it work? I uh, kind of did. Yeah, it's nice. Woo, look at that. That is some cool shit. This is where you want to save your budget. And you got a creepy, creepy...
creepy guy in the rain about to like stab you on a cover. And this is Mark. It just says Mark. Interesting. I didn't realize that uh, he inked it. It's nice. It looks good. It looks good. So hopefully that was interesting for you. Hopefully that that gives you a little bit of insight into the process of this. Um, you know, you're going to be pushed and pulled and really, really challenged um, drawing pages. It's it's a, a very fun thing to do, but it's hard. You know, it's no joke. A tremendous amount of respect for these guys. I, I did before, but like, man, you give it a shot and you're like, ooh, okay, boy, they're actually... I knew they were really good, but they're even better than I thought. <laughs> Ah, oh, so good. It's just classic, classic comic stuff. I really do hope that IDW or DC, or I'm not sorry, DC, Marvel or something, is able to do some sort of an artist edition uh, for Sylvester's uh, Marvel work in particular. The Either X-Men or Wolverine or a combination of the two would be really, really cool. I think he and Dan definitely deserve it. The Wolverine series is really interesting as it goes along because you definitely start to see the impact of Jim Lee on Mark's stuff. Um, especially the last couple of issues. It's still got this this very kinetic... This almost has a little bit of a John Romita Jr. vibe or Frank Miller kind of thing going on. It's interesting. I I always say this. Any Mark Silvestri-focused video, I always say I, I just wish that mark would do some interviews and talk about drawing like a lot like i want like a two-hour interview where you just talk to mark about drawing what what his evolution was because he's, he's so good he might not know though sometimes when people have this much ability it's just like i don't know it's sad and i drew and it got better and i learned this i learned that he's got the magic touch That's such crazy structure. It's very Buscema. Oh, I've mentioned this to a couple of friends. So there's a John Buscema book that's going to be coming out. I don't know. I didn't get the impression that it's going to be like an artist edition per se, but I think there's sort of maybe a blend of it, but it's supposed to be like a 220 page book that the family sort of helped put together. I don't have any idea when it comes out. I think if you just Google like John Buscema 220 page book or new book, um, could probably find some info. I think I saw it on Facebook. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of excited about it because I really think that John Buscema is just a great, great artist. He's super influential to so many artists that I like that uh, I don't think you could really go wrong having a 220-page book of Buscema. <laughs> right? <laughs> Who's with me? So... Hopefully this makes up a little bit for not doing a live stream today. Kelsey, you and your f f having to drive to go pick up your brother. Oh, that's nice. So loose and so much energy. Damn. Yeah, please recommend some artists, modern day artists, uh, and and we could have two categories. We'll have the virtuosos, meaning people that don't necessarily do monthly work, but then for sure, let's try to look at a few artists that actually do produce, say, eight to ten books a year, because um, I I do think that there's different challenges and different solutions that they use, um, you know. So it'll it would be fun to to sort of differentiate the two because it's not fair if someone spends a year on one comic um that that's a different uh a little bit of a different thing not a little quite a bit as you figure a lot of the european graphic novels are like that they do one book a year um and uh they most of the time they look real good you know some technology you know, but if I, I don't know if this was pre designed before Mark had to do it, but if it wasn't and they just said, uh, we need like a shield helicopter, come up with something, I mean, odds are he just kind of probably made this up that day. You know, I don't know, uh, the like the vehicle armory that that book has. So, and these are really simple tires. Or whatever this is, is it? Uh, maybe it's just gears. It kind of look like wheels, but I don't think it is. 
This is nice. Again, he really keeps his arms simple. I mean, it's generally like three shapes and a little bit of an indication of the elbow, just from the, the forearm to the wrist I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, he doesn't go, he doesn't really go nuts with it. You see even here, it's one, two, three lines. He's got chunk, uh, you know, the divider with the other chunk and the other chunk. And that's really about it. This is two. <laughs> this is funny. Head, torso, and whims. All individually controllable. <laughs> We've already talked about this little girl. I, I found her, her dialogue um, quite uh, challenging, I'll say. Damn. Kapap. It, this is interesting, too. So I'll point this out. I had to do someone getting punched in the book, and it really didn't turn out as nice as I would have hoped that it would have. Um, but uh, I had to do it in a small panel. But uh, these are equal size panels, basically. You know, it's a little covered up here, but... Uh, you know, Kirby and Buscema and the older Marvel books would do fight scenes with like six panel pages, but uh, it can be done. But but boy, you really do feel like you're squeezing in um, a lot of information, and and you know, it's like, do you draw both arms? You know, for him he did, but for this guy he didn't, and really there's none of his figure in this. And and on this one, he's got a little bit of the shoulder, and then just a touch of the hand, but. It sort of helps, but a lot of times what you'll see with, with uh, fight scenes like this is I call it contraction and then expansion. So do you see this shape is contracted and then there's the release here, bam, even though it's a different character punching. But but that's generally how you orchestrate fight scenes from panel to panel. For me, I just had to draw one, it was like one punch, like in the first panel. Um, but uh, yeah, so do you see this? This is contraction and creating tension and then boom release expanded arm so you can kind of see that with uh in particular uh old marvel fight scenes but i think it works even for more fancy panel layouts you know like something more contemporary so okay i need to start wrapping this thing up because i've got to do all those color um recommendations so it'll be fun but uh, it's gonna take some work and Patreon, you have a video coming today. Uh, it is a drawing video on um, some subtleties of anatomy that I think will really help people draw better figures. I've I actually I shot five videos already for you guys. They're in the can. I did them all in one day. I was inspired. <laughs> wee -a wee, wee -a wee. I did. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, let me get out of full screen mode. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've gone over the time that I was going to spend on this. There's a gun. He's got enough real stuff. Like, like there's, I, or I don't know if real stuff would be the right word, but, but, uh, like, you know, this works for me as someone that's just a fan of comic books and needs some sort of a semblance of a gun. I could definitely have more, but, uh, again, this is old, old art. The gun game has been raised heavily by concept art. That's cool. Oh, actually, it looks pretty cool. But yeah, I want to get better at that. I, I love to see people um, design weapons and very kick-ass you know, vehicles. But, you know, they're creating them for video games and movies, generally. Or, or they're in school learning design like that. But, you know, we want our comic books to have that kick-assness. His gear is so neat, too. Fun. Fun, fun stuff. This is a nice page. And that's actually really cool, too. Her head's a very weird shape. I mean, it's like, you know, if you look at books on, like, how to draw kids, uh, they, you know, they really play up these shapes. But he did it real good. Which leads me to believe that he has some sort of an illustrative background. And it could be that he just learned from the right books. Um, but he does things kind of, like, in a weird way by the book. Meaning that, like... Uh, I've talked about Bernie Wrightson as a teenager uh, signed up for the famous art art artist school online or not online sorry <laughs> mail they would deliver these portfolios for you and you would do the assignments and then mail them in and you would get critiques I'm not saying that Mark did that but 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 it it to me Mark seems to have some sort of a traditional art background now he may have gotten that sort of through what he studied. You know, like he studied the right artists and was able to like put it together. Again, this is why Mark would be a very, very interesting interview is like, what was his foundational skills 
um, going into comics. Did he just study comics? I kind of don't think so. He had to have coupled that with something a little bit more real. But I, I don't I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to be guessing. So nice. I used to own some X-Men pages of Mark's, but they were really, really just, like, boring pages. No offense to Mark, but it was just, like, you know, a guy waking up and hitting an alarm clock and stuff like that from X-Men. But I sold them. But they were, when I bought them, they were, like, $20 pages on, on eBay. I don't even think you could get 100 for them now, to be honest. There's just nothing on them, you know. But I wanted to see their work in person. So I bought, I think, like four of them. They were so cheap. You know, how could you go wrong? But once I had them for a while, I was kind of over it. This is nice. You know, again, is this like an exact car? No, probably not. This is funny, too. This is cool. I like this. <laughs> yeah, these are funny shots. But again, you, know, you look how simplified all this is. It's good enough. You know, he had to draw two guys gawking at girls in a truck and Wolverine chatting them up too. But uh, a lot of it's covered up. He did the girls in black so he wouldn't have to draw back views of, of characters, which can be a little tricky, like the ass and legs and stuff. It can look a little awkward. Um, it, it's a weird thing. If you've had to draw it, you, you know what I'm talking about. Planting the feet on the ground and whatnot. This is something that I used to say, and I'm going to end it actually on this little bit of advice. If, if you ever are trying to draw something and you're having trouble with it and you, you don't have a ton of experience, which, which I consider myself to be someone like that, um, if you do start to look through some comic books to see if you can find something similar and you don't seem to find it, that possibly could be a tell that artists avoid that shot because it doesn't really work that well so it's just something to consider because i remember a long time ago i would like make stuff up and go oh yeah like this would be cool and then you you know it's a hard shot and you're trying to figure it out and it just doesn't seem to want to go together and then you know if you have the time you know maybe you go like i wonder if like so and so has ever done anything like this and you start hunting around and you don't find it it's there could be a reason why so take that for what it's worth. I'm not saying it's a, and again, back views, he blacked them out. Now, is that a rule book that he has in his mind? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it could also be just sort of a design element, but uh, you know, he would definitely be able to draw these, but would it benefit the P, the panel? Maybe, maybe not. Again, kind of the Mignola vibe here. So, okay, you guys have a great day. I love you all. I'll be back um, this weekend with another video. And then Kelsey and I will be back next week. So enjoy this. Have a good day. Comment, please. I'd be very, very interested. Check out my Patreon. I'm telling you, I crush it on Patreon. And uh, then Blaster Kid and uh, all of Kelsey's links. We still love Kelsey, even though he sometimes is a busy bee. All right, bye.